this lecture, we're going to cover the phylum Echinodermata. So these are animals like sea stars and sea urchins and uh, sea cucumbers. I like those guys. So recall that Echinodermata is part of the deuterostome clade, right? Deuterostomia. And so remember that when the gastralization occurs, that the first invagination of the tissues uh, will then develop the anus, right? And then the mouth develops afterward. That was opposite of the proto protostomes that we learned before. So again, Canvas has really good review on all of that. And then also remember that their um, cleavage, when the uh, cells divide by mitosis, um, the zygote develop, divides by mitosis, it's radial cleavage. So you can see when the new cells divide and move upward, it moves directly above. That's radial cleavage. If it moved off to the corner, that would be spiral cleavage, okay? Uh, and then also indeterminate means that none of these cells are fated to a specific task. So if you remove one of these cells, cleavage would continue and then you would have two embryos. Okay. Okay. Again, different from the uh, protostomes. So there were two phyla in the deuterostomia. And so this one is the kind of dermata and um, the other one are the chordates. And so the chordates are on a different lecture. So let's learn about echinoderms. Um, echinoderms are, you know, you first might look at this and go, well, wait a minute, they're radially symmetrical. Look at that. Um, and they are as adults. So as adults, not only are they radially symmetrical, but they always have five parts or multiples of fives, right? But this is a secondary body plan. They actually, their larvae are bilateral. So this tells us, and now molecular data shows us that the echinoderms actually evolved from a bilateral ancestor. And that bilaterality is only retained in their larval stages, right? But then they move to a radial symmetrically, uh, radial symmetrical body plan as in the adult form, okay? And so in the adult form, again, when you're radially symmetrical, then any part of your body can encounter the environment, right? So cephalization is absent. They'll actually have sensory structures along the edges here, okay? So again, no head. Um, the surface containing the mouth is on the underside, and that's what we call the oral surface, O-R-A-L, right? And then on the opposite side, this side typically bears the anus, and it's just usually a tiny small hole that you can't see, um, but that's the aboral side. Okay, so for all the echinoderms, whatever side you have the mouth, that's called the oral side, like your mouth, the oral cavity, right? And then the other side of it is typically the, the opposite side, then that's the aboral side, okay? It's not dorsal and ventral like we have with bilaterally symmetrical animals, okay? All right, so what else about Echinodermata. They don't have a brain, but they have a very simple nervous system. And the nervous system will actually extend through each of the arms of the echinoderm. They do have an endoskeleton. Um, it's, uh, I'll actually pop back to this slide in just a minute. It's a um, endoskeleton made of calcium. So we call that a calcareous endoskeleton, it's these little calcium carbonate plates, and then it fits underneath an integument, the skin on top, right? And so that formation of the skeleton can give rise to tubercles, like all of these um, little projections coming out of this, um, or tubercles are more uh, low-lying bumps, these are spines coming out of this uh, sea urchin. And then there's also something called pelodiserae. And those are like little spikes that can come out. I'll show you that in the next one. Uh, let me go back before we move on. Uh, actually, I'm gonna go through each one of these. Yeah, I'm gonna go through each one of these um, uh, in detail. 
So we'll come back to the exos endoskeleton. Um, if I said exoskeleton before, I'm sorry. I mean to say endoskeleton. I'm not quite sure what I said now. They have a water vascular system, so an ability to, to transport water throughout the entire body. They don't have any excretory organs, so respiration and excretion is mainly done by uh, diffusion for most things, but you can see there is an anus, so some things can actually move out. Uh, and then auto auto autonomy, um, again, this means that they can intentionally detach a part of their body that will later degenerate. So these are the key characteristics or defining characteristics of the phylum Echinodermata. Okay, so back to endoskeleton, I mentioned uh, it has that calcium carbonate skeleton. And so here are the projections that can happen along the spine, right? So these are pet petalicerae, okay? Um, and again, these are just little uh, structures that can stick out, kind of protecting the organism from predators and things. Here are spines. They can be even longer, like you saw in the um, sea urchin. They can produce poisons as well. Some sea urchins, you don't want to touch them. It's the most pain you've ever felt in your life. Um, so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, th there's also, do I, let me, I'm going to pop ahead just a little bit, see. Oh, okay. I just wanted to mention um, uh, pedicellicerae. Um, and so these are little defensive um, structures that have what you might call jaws or little tooth pinchers. Um, and they attach on a stalk on the surface of the body of the uh, sea star, right? And um, it can be poisonous sometimes. Um, it can be positioned at the base of movable spines. And um, um, so this just kind of shows how they respond when uh, they're stimulated. So the pedicellicerae respond to stimuli independently of one another, of the main nervous system. And they actually possess their own neuromuscular components uh, located along the, the base of the spine, right? So here you can see a spine being grasped, right? Um, and the C start now, all of those spines in that area can, can attack this thing that's grabbing it, right? So uh, interesting little um, defense mechanism they have there. Okay, so one of the other characteristics was a water vascular system, right? So in this water vascular system, uh, they form what's in the center of the body, the ring canal. And let me pop back a little bit. That's what you see here is the ring canal, right? And it's open to the madreporite. So the madreporite is where water can enter into the ring canal. And then each one of these ring canals has a radial canal that extends into each arm of the, uh, of the echinoderm. So here they're only showing one but in each one of these, you would have one moving in there. And then at the end, they branch off and they produce these, what are called ampullae, these little bulbs. Looks like the, the lines are off a little bit. So the ring canal is this line going down here, right, right down the center. And then the ampullae are these little bulbs, right? So we can see those and those end in, in tube feet on the, on the outer surface. So they penetrate through, the body of the conoderm and ends in tube feet. So let me show you that right here. So here you see it without the rest of the body. So here's the ring canal, right, with the madreporite uh, connects to the ring canal via the stone canal. Then each ring canal radiates into a radial canal into each uh, segment of the body. And then they have these bulbs. So again, water is passing through here and can get into these bulbs called ampullae. And then from there, they terminate into the tube feet, which um, project on the out, out bottom surface, the outer surface of the, of the um, oh, excuse me, the, um, it's killing me. 
a sea star or something. So here's the tube feet, right? And so what happens with that water canal system, they can control the flow of water through there, through the ampullae, and then control the movement of the feet. So the feet then can function in movement. It can function in feeding, right? Um, so they can use them as suckers to grab onto things. Um, uh, sensory, they're also, as they're moving around and crawling around, here you can see tube feet as they're crawling around, um, they can also help with sensory as well. So um, again, just to, just to show you that overall structure, this is the, the one of the hallmarks of um, echinoderms is this water vascular system. So they don't have a circulatory system with hemocyl or anything like that. Okay, um, they, they have here what's, what's known then as their water vascular system. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, so again, the madreporite, just to use the other terms that we had, um, the madreporite is on the aboral surface of the body of the organism, right? Um, there are a few though where the madreporite is on the um, uh, oral surface. So we might see that in a couple of the different uh, groups that we look at. Okay, I think I'm going to leave it for that for now. I'm having a hard time moving my mouse. So excuse me if I seem like I'm settling on a slide for too long. Um, they do reproduce sexually with separate sexes. So there are male and female. And, but each male and female will release their egg and sperm into the water column and um, uh, reproduce by external fertilization. Okay, and so, and remember the other one, they can drop one of the arms in order to, that will regenerate into a whole new organism. And the one who lost the arm will generate a new arm. So that's asexual reproduction as well. Okay. And remember that the eggs will produce a chemical that attracts the sperm over to them. But there's usually some kind of coordination as well. Sometimes they use, um, it could be the full moon as a cue, as a time to reproduce. It could be the temperature of the water that changes as a time to reproduce. Those that are more shallow, it could be a change in the um, light that's penetrating through as a time to reproduce. So they do have ways to synchronize their reproduction. That would make sense. All right, so in the phylum Echinodermata, we have five main classes. Uh, they're seen here. They're called Asteroidea, Ophoroidea, Echinoidea, Crinoidea, and Holothuroidea. Have fun pronouncing those. <laughs> So we'll go eat through each one of these and look at, again, their main characteristics. So the first one is the class Crinoidea. Um, these are actually very abundant in the fossil record. They're called feather stars. Sometimes they're called uh, sea lilies as well. And again, they're, they tend to be um, uh, Cecil and they, their arms extend and they filter feed on microorganisms in the water column. Okay, and so um, their body kind of forms a cup or a calyx and then their arms kind of extend outward. Uh, the, so the oral surface is actually facing upward and the aboral surface is uh, pointing downward. Okay, um, there's really no external madreporate for them. So the mouse, mouth and the anus are the same uh, structure on the oral surface. Okay. Um, so the, the um, arms uh, have uh, ciliated grooves that are used for suspension feeding. And um, uh, it just kind of as it grabs onto, again, usually microscopic food particles, it'll conduct it down that groove toward the mouth of the, the organism uh, in order for digestion to occur, but it doesn't have a lot of digestion to occur. Okay, some, I mentioned they're mainly sessile. There are actually some that can be modal or they can crawl a little bit. Sometimes they see, they're seen swimming and just to try to change their position. Again, mainly um, being sessile and then suspension feeding or filter feeding. 
right? Uh, they can actually catch small crustaceans though as well. So there is some digestion that'll go on. So that's crinoidea, again, really abundant in the fossil record. So sometimes you'll see fossils labeled crinoidea and that, that's, so we have extant or living species today. Um, class Echinoidea, so these are sea urchins and sand dollars. Um, their body is either like a globe, what you see here with the, um, the uh, uh, sea urchin, or they're flattened like a sand dollar. I'm not sure I have a picture of the sand dollar. Um, uh, let's see, so their uh, madreporites and the anus are on the aboral surface, okay, the aboral surface. Um, that's usually up, so there's the water pourer, that's the madreporite. This is the aboral surface, sticks up. And then they have tube feet along the bottom, but also these spines can be movable as well. Okay, and then their feeding is through a specialized structure called um, Aristotle's lantern. It has uh, jaws with jaws and teeth facing outward. Let me show you a picture of that. This is, if I can advance it, there it is. This is referred to as Aristotle's lantern. So it has these movable parts to it. So it's not true jaws like we see in the vertebrates, but um, it's got little spikes on there too that act as teeth. So they can really crush down uh, some good, um, uh, crustaceans and things like that. Uh, some of them have been known to um, feed voraciously on kelp forests and they reduce the kelp forests. And so there's been a, a connection between sea otters and the decline of sea otters and the proliferation of sea urchins. So sea otters eat sea urchins and sea otters have been declining up in Northern California and on North. Um, uh, they were seen as um, competition with the fishermen. So sometimes the fishermen will want to get rid of them. So their, their numbers greatly declined and uh, kelp beds started declining. Well, kelp beds are a place for fish to lay their eggs. They're very protected inside of there. So when the kelp beds vanish, then our fish vanish. And that's what the fishermen want to go for, right? Well, why were they vanishing? Because when uh, sea otters were um, on the decline, they weren't eating all of the sea urchins. So the sea urchins proliferated and they just started eating up all the kelp beds. So our kelp was reducing, which then caused the decline again of many, many other species, not just fish. Um, so we need to protect the sea otters to help control the, um, the, uh, the um, ah, sea urchins as well. Okay, um, uh, sand dollars usually burrow in the sand and they feed on particulate matter. So you might wanna look up sand dollars, see what those look like. Those are, uh, they're sold a lot in stores. People like to collect them on the beach. Um, uh, uh, but again, you wanna make sure that it isn't living anymore and leave it on the beach otherwise. Okay. Next class is holothroidia. Uh, so these are, in ge uh, the general word, uh, the common name for them are sea cucumbers because they're cucumber shaped. <laughs> they remind people of a cucumber. They don't have any arms, like in many of the other classes. Um, they have spines are also absent. The endoskeleton is also reduced. Um, and uh, they do have tube feet. Um, so the body is mainly fleshy and elongate. Uh, the madreporite is, inter is internal. And again, uh, most of the tube feet, they're reduced as well. They're absent except for these feeding tentacles. These are like modified tube feet around the mouth. Um, and so they can ex excrete them outside of their mouth and, and they're sticky. And again, kind of filter feed. Um, the the aboral the, or the oral side is that instead of being on top or the bottom, these take more of a longitudinal body shape. So the oral side is on one side and the aboral side is on the other side, All right? They do have a water vascular system though um, with an internal madreporite. It opens into, um, into the same structure, the short stone canal, the ring canal, so on and so forth. So all of that is the same. 
it's just kind of um, separated or you know shaped a little bit differently. Okay. Um, let's see. So uh, so they again they do have tube feet, so they can use those for locomotion and some slight muscular contractions help with that. Uh, let's see. Um, I think that's good. I'm going to leave it at that for the class Holothuroidea. Those are sea cucumbers. Okay. Uh, you might see some of these if you go snorkeling off our coastline as well. The class Asteroidea are probably what you're most um, familiar with. Uh, these have the typical five arms. Um, they have tube feet on the bottom. They're very predatory on bivalves. They can take their tube feet and their suckers and they can attach to either end of the bivalve. Remember things like clams and scallops and things, and they can pry it open. Okay, bivalves are really hard, they're really strong, so that, but they get, these guys can pry them open and then they can evert their stomach. They can push their own stomach out of their body into the bivalve and digest the bivalve in its own shell, and then uh, take the mouth and, and bring in the food into their body. Really interesting organisms being able to do that. All right. Um, so the anus is on the aboral surface over here, and the mouth is on the oral surface underneath. Okay. Uh, again, suckered tube feet, so it helps in locomotion and again, feeding as well. Um, sometimes again, you'll see different species. They'll look different because uh, on the aboral side, they'll have um, different tubercles, you know, bumps and knobs and things, spines, uh, petit illicerae at the base of the spines, um, that kind of thing. Um, so again, asteroidia, asteroids, uh, you know, astronomy means stars, right? And so that's why they named this, this group uh, Asteroidea. They're pretty uh, opportunistic predators as well. They can also be scavengers. And so um, you find them on almost any dead animal matter at the bottom of the ocean. Um, so they do, they feed on a lot of things. Um, so that's uh, class Asteroidea. If you click here in, in the lab, we would do a starfish dissection. So uh, if you want, you can look at starfish dissection images there. Okay, and the next one, Ophoroidea. So these are somewhat similar to the Asteroidea, but um, they have five long slender arms um, and their tube feet are not used for locomotion, right? Um, they work a little bit differently. Um, so they don't have suckers on the end of their tube feet. Um, the, the, um, uh, they use uh, the articulated arms um, for feeding and they can also use those to kind of pull themselves along for locomotion as well. Okay, um, what else do I wanna say? Just wanna break this down for you. There's no pedicellicerae on these guys and they tend to browse on the sea bottom or they filter feed. Okay, uh, let's see. Eh, I think that's pretty much it. Their water vascular system is much more similar to Asteroidea. Um, but again, I think the main thing is, is their, their arms are just much more flexible. They're a little more jointed, so they kind of flex. Whereas you can see here on this sea star, that is more rigid, but it's their tube feet that can move along, move for the asteroid. Okay. And that's it for Echinodermata. We're going to keep it at that. Um, so again, just know uh, the phylum, the characteristics of the phylum, and know the characteristics of each of the classes and be able to identify a, a representative uh, animal for that class and you're gonna be good to go. All right, thanks everybody.